Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. Fast starting today at 6 o'clock and then ending this coming Wednesday at 6 o'clock and then we'll come together Wednesday night and just have a good time in the Lord. Doesn't that sound good? We'll just come together and uh, you can eat right before you come to church and, and get a little strength back. And I appreciate all of you who are participating in that. How many believe that fasting and prayer changes things? I believe that, and I believe that God is going to do things on our behalf uh, through this time of prayer and fasting. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33. And I'm asking you to preach with me tonight. I, I will not preach long but I would ask you to preach with me. Matthew 6 and 33. If you have that, say amen. And could we read this together out loud? We're only going to read the one verse, but let's read it together if we could. It's a familiar verse, Jesus speaking here. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Could we read that one more time? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. I'd like to preach for a few moments tonight from this subject. Demands before demonstration. Demands before demonstration. Can we put our Bibles down and could you just lift your hands and ask the Lord to help us tonight uh, to receive his word. Dear Lord Jesus, we love you. I thank you for one more opportunity to come together in spirit and in truth to worship you. I pray that you would help this humble vessel tonight to deliver the word that you've laid on my heart and help me to deliver it the way that you gave it to me, God. I pray that we would receive it on good ground, Lord, and we give you praise and we give you glory. Could you just clap your hands to the Lord and just come on, just go ahead and open up your mouth and praise him. Hallelujah, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We magnify you. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. Thank you for worshiping. And you may be seated. I'm going to spend the next few minutes tonight trying to convince you that the following statement is true, even though I know that for some of us it's going to push against our preconceived ideas of God. Are you ready? Here it goes. God always demands something from us before he will give us a divine demonstration. God always demands something from us before he will give us a divine demonstration. We just read where Jesus is preaching the famous Sermon on the Mount, and he's right in the middle of a point about money and possessions, when out of the blue... He makes a demand. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Make God's kingdom the number one priority in your life. And if you do this, all of these other things are going to be added unto you. If you will put the kingdom of God first, Jesus has promised us that he will provide for us. He will take care of us. And, and we won't have to be fearful and fretful about the future, just like the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, God will provide for us if we will put his kingdom above all else. He made a demand and then he promised a demonstration. Someone said a demonstration. It's a principle that we see over and over again in the Bible. And here's the difficulty. Everybody wants the demonstrations, but very few people will accept God's demand. It's the demands that most people struggle to accept. We're all guilty of this at some point or another. We Pentecostals, we apostolics, we're people of the demonstration. Amen? We love divine demonstrations. We want, we want miracles, but we struggle with faith. We want signs and wonders, but we struggle with prayer. We want deliverance, but we struggle with fasting. Can I get a praise the Lord? We want revival, but we struggle with personal evangelism. 
We want the fire to fall, but we struggle with sacrifice. We want righteousness, but we struggle with holiness. We want blessings and abundance, but we struggle with giving. Well, I'm on the subject of giving, and I knew it was going to get tight the minute I talked about giving, but but while I'm on the subject of giving, let me just take you again to the words of Jesus, this time in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6 and verse 38. Jesus said this, and you'll all recognize it, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over. That's another demand before a demonstration. Jesus said, if you want to receive good measure, pressed down, shaken together, how many want the abundance of God? How many want the blessings of God? How many believe that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills? God God holds this whole world in His hands. Everything that is within this world, contained in this world, belongs to God. And if we want to receive from God, he said, okay, I want to give to you, but I'm going to make a demand. You've got to give first. If you want to be a receiver, you've got to be a giver first. How many know that's a principle from the word of God? Look at what God says. I I know I'm going to, it's going to get tight here, but look at what God says in Malachi 3 and 10. He said, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me. Now herewith saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. You know what God's saying? God says, I want to give you a blessing that is so big, you won't even have room enough to contain the blessing that I want to give you. And I've got a demonstration that I want to pour out in your life. But if you want to see the divine demonstration, you're going to have to meet some demands. And God says, I want you to prove me right now. Test me and see if I won't do it you just bring your tithes into the storehouse and you just watch and see if I won't bless you I wish somebody could testify with me by clapping their hands to the Lord and let somebody know that when you will be faithful to God when you will put the kingdom of God first God will always bless you God will always the demonstrations going to be there but God has some demands that he wants us to meet first Sometimes we've got to be obedient. This is a hard lesson for us to learn. I know in my life this was a difficult lesson for me to learn, but sometimes God calls us to be obedient before we understand the reasons why. You see, we're living in a world where people want you to convince them first and they want to understand every facet of the situation before they're willing to surrender to anybody or anything and that includes God. But God says, oh no, that's not the way it works. You've got to trust me first. You've got to believe in me first. You've got to meet some demands and then you're going to see a demonstration in your life. Look at what Proverbs 2 and verse number 1 says. It says, if thou wilt receive my words... And this is God speaking and hide my commandments with thee. How many are thankful for the commandments of God? So that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, listen to wisdom, and apply your heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lift up thy voice for understanding, if thou seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasure, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. How many know that there are some things that you've got to be obedient first and then God will give you an understanding? But preacher, I don't want to live that way. I don't want to do that because I don't understand it. Hey, if you want to see the demonstration of God, you're going to have to meet some demands and you're going to have to believe and trust God. Even when, it, you know, when, when we're carnal, in our carnal flesh, there are things that just don't make sense to us. How many know that's, that's true? You know, it's very difficult for us to understand the moving of the Holy Spirit when we're trying to understand it in carnality. But it's when we have a spiritual mindset that the things of the Spirit begin to make sense to us. How many are thankful for the things of the Spirit tonight? How many are thankful you've got the Holy Ghost tonight? How many are thankful that God meets us and touches us and blesses us? And So God demands obedience even before we fully understand everything there is to know about God. And, and you know, how many understand that there are some things the Bible, Paul said, now we see through a, gl- a glass darkly. 
There are some things that in this present world we're never going to fully understand. But oh, when we're on the other side in glory, all of a sudden we're going to see things clearly as if it's almost like when you take sunglasses. Have you ever wore sunglasses before? I don't like sunglasses because when I put them on, I, I always feel a little off balance because sometimes they're so dark that I can't see clearly. And then when you take them off, all of a sudden it's like the world is bright again. How many know when we're on the other side and when we're with the Lord, things are going to make sense that we can't fully understand right now? Noah, in my opinion, is one of the great heroes of the Bible. He had never seen rain and, and uh, he didn't have any idea what a flood was. All he knew is that God said judgment was coming. God said rain is going to fall. And in order for Noah and his family to be saved, he was going to have to obey some very strange and very detailed demands from God. This is perhaps one of the most detailed uh, demands that God ever gave anyone in Scripture. God said, Noah, I want you to make an ark and I want you to make it out of wood, but not just any wood. I want you to make sure that you use gopher wood. And I want you to build rooms and I want you to build them a certain way because animals are going to come from, from all over the world and, and, uh, and I want you to seal it on the inside and on the outside. And God gave Noah some very specific measurements and dimensions for building. He even instructed Noah on how to make sure that they would have enough food to survive the flood. This was a massive thing for God to demand of Noah. Most scholars believe that it took Noah nearly 75 years to build the ark. Think about that. 75 years. For, for 75 years, Noah had to endure the mockery of his peers and, and the disdain of his neighbors as they looked at him as he was doing something that seemed silly and unreasonable. Noah, what are you talking about? We've never seen water fall from the sky. That's crazy, Noah. Why are you doing this? This, this is humongous. This is massive. Is this really necessary? And all the while, Noah just kept on doing what God told him to do. Noah, he got a hammer every morning and said, I, God told me that a flood's coming and I'm going to get my little family and we're going to keep on working for God. I, I wish someone would get a hold of that spirit tonight and say, you know what? It doesn't always make sense, but I'm going to keep on building the kingdom. It, it doesn't always make sense, but I'm going to pray anyway. It, it doesn't always make sense, but I'm going to fast anyway. It, it doesn't always make sense, but, but I'm going to be faithful to the house of God. It, it doesn't always make sense, but I'm going to do what God's word has instructed me to do. Oh, I wish somebody would clap your hands to the Lord and say, God has been faithful to me. 75 years. 75 years of trusting and believing that they would witness a divine demonstration if they would just remain obedient to God. One of the great one of the great things that always strikes me in the story of Noah is that his children remained faithful with him as he, as he worked on that ark. You know, if the, the children could have run away. They could have run off and said, Dad's crazy. He's lost his mind. We want to do what everyone else is doing. That's what a lot of people are doing today, isn't it? But they said, no, we, we recognize that our father has a relationship with God. And, and, and we know, even though we don't understand it, that, that something is coming, that something is brewing in the atmosphere and because they were faithful to their father and because Noah remained faithful to God they were able to be saved in one of the greatest catastrophes the world has ever seen did you know the flood is one of the few things if you study this in science uh, we many scientists are, are hard-pressed to admit it today but but it, in every culture of the world they have a history and they have a and they have rec uh, they have uh, writings and manuscripts that they found that detail a worldwide flood. It literally, sh it literally was one of the greatest catastrophes the world has ever seen. But Noah and his family were able, were able to live through the judgment and the wrath of God because they were faithful to God and they met the demands of God. One of the greatest scriptures in your entire Bible is found in Genesis chapter 6 and 22. It says this, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. Thus did Noah according 
to all that God commanded him. There's something about simply doing what God calls us to do. There's something about simply being willing to obey the words of God, the voice of God, the word of God. How many are thankful for the word of God tonight? In the book of, in, in the book of Exodus, the Hebrews prepared their doorposts with blood before the angel of death came through the camp. It's the only thing that saved them. Did you know that all through your Bible, the only thing that saved people was obedience to God, obedience to what God called them to do. I don't know about you, but if the Bible tells me to do something, I want to be obedient to the word of God because I, I desire to be pleasing to God. And because of their obedience, they prepared the doorpost. They prepared the blood. They were spared by the mercy of God. We see in the word of God, there was before the demonstration could come, before, before the divine could happen, God instructed Moses very carefully. They were, they were dying in the wilderness. They were, they were thirsty. They were dying of thirst in a desert place. And God spoke to Moses and he said, I want you to go to that rock and, and I want you to do something that seems crazy. I want you to do something that it's going to seem ridiculous, but I want you to take your staff and I want you to strike that rock as hard as you can. And I want you to stay Stand back and, and wait for the demonstration. And when Moses was faithful and obedient to the demands of God, when he struck that rock, all of a sudden water, the unthinkable happened. Water began to flow from that rock. I'm talking to somebody tonight. You, you need a refreshing in your life. And it's time for you to just listen to the voice of God. And God is going to do a miraculous thing in your life. The walls of Jericho, another tremendous story from the word of God where, where God gave them specific instructions, something that seemed crazy, something that seemed ridiculous. God said, I want you to march around the walls of Jericho for seven days. And on the seventh day, I want you to march seven times. And at the end of the seventh time, I want you to blow the trumpets and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. I wonder what would have happened if they would have been disobedient to the voice of God, but because they were willing Willing to do something even though it may have seemed a little strange. Though you know the rest of the story. The walls came down. I wonder if there would be somebody willing tonight to just lift up your voice. And shout unto God with a voice of triumph. I know we're fasting. I know we're already hungry. I know we're already tired. But I wonder if someone would lift up your hands right now and just say, Lord, uh, we're asking you to tear some walls down. Uh, we're asking you to bring some barriers down. Lord, we're fasting right now because we want to see divine demonstrations demonstrations apostolic tabernacle has committed itself to a time of prayer and fasting lord because we desire to see the miraculous we desire to see obstacles fall we we desire to see the unthinkable happen Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost starting to move in this place. I, I, I wonder if somebody right now, you would begin to think of that thing, that wall, that obstacle, that thing that seems as though it's absolutely impossible. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That, that loved one that you've been praying for for 30 years. I want you to begin to pray for them right now in the spirit. I feel the Holy Ghost anointing somebody. That, that, that sickness that someone's been dealing with for a long time. Come on, begin to pray for it right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm praying that walls would begin to fall, that barriers would begin to crumble, Lord, during this time of prayer, this time of fasting. Four starving lepers made up their minds that they weren't just going to sit there until they died. How many remember that story? Four lepers, the Syrians were, were literally starving them out and they were so hungry they sat there and they said you know what we're not going to just sit here until we die notice now here's why I brought this up God did not tell those lepers that they were required to do this sometimes we've got to just get desperate enough that we do something on our own 
But they understood that they, they couldn't just sit there and do nothing. You know, sometimes when things get so bad that, and you're just sitting there paralyzed, you've got to make up your mind. I'm not just going to sit here and just wait for death to come or just wait for depression to wash over me or, or just wait for me to get to a place where I can hardly move because I'm paralyzed with fear. Sometimes we've got to just say, I've got to do something, anything, even if it seems crazy. I, I'm not just going to sit here. I may be a leper. I may be starving. I may be thirsty. I may not know where to go, but we're going to get up. And you know, and then they said, you know what? We're going to do this. We're just going to go to where the Syrians are. And we know they've got food there. Maybe they'll kill us. We don't know what's going to happen. But we know we can't just sit here and do nothing. I'm preaching to somebody at Apostolic Tabernacle. It might be time for somebody to just get up and do something. You may not know what to do, but just get up and find something to do. Nobody told the woman with the issue of blood to crawl through the crowd that day. Nobody told her to touch the hem of his garment. God didn't speak to her and say, hey, you better get over there and touch Jesus. No, she just realized I can't sit here until I die. I've tried everything that I know to try, but I've got to get a hold of Jesus. I wish someone would get this in your spirit tonight. If you want to see the demonstrations of God, if you want to see the miraculous, you may have to move from where you are. Do something that seems crazy. I don't mind it every once in a while when somebody gets up and starts dancing in the presence of God and people look at them funny. You know what? They made up their mind. I'm not just going to sit here until I die. Every once in a while, somebody just takes a lap in in church. You know what? They're saying, look, I'm not just going to sit here until I die. I am going to see God move in my life. Nobody told blind Bartimaeus to make a commotion that day. In fact, they did just the opposite. They said, blind Bartimaeus, you need to to quiet down. You're embarrassing us. But he realized that he just had to do something. Nobody told David to go fight Goliath. In fact, they were all discouraging. And, And certainly nobody told him to go down and find five smooth stones. But he made up his mind. Somebody's got to do something. Somebody has to get in touch with God because we need a divine demonstration. And you know what happened. Goliath fell. When you will begin to move and get up from where you are and involve yourself in the battle, God will bless your efforts. And God will move. Praise the Lord. Sometimes God calls us to do, give things when it hurts us to give. The widow woman, we know the story. Elijah came and, and the prophet was hungry. And, and the widow woman gave the prophet her last morsel of food. And she didn't know how she was going to be provided for. She didn't know how her child was going to be provided for. And when she met the demand that God gave, God provided for her enough oil and enough flour to last all through the famine. How many could raise your hand and testify that when you give, even when you don't know how it's all going to work out, there will be a demonstration in your life. God will do a great thing. First, Jesus looked at the disciples in the New Testament and he said, follow me. That was the demand. Everyone said demand. And then he said, I will make you fishers of men. If you want to be a soul winner, if you want to be a disciple, if you want to be someone great in the kingdom of God, first, you're going to have to follow Jesus. Seek after him. Be obedient to his voice. Listen to him. Praise God. The first revival began with a demand. As the musicians come and get ready, just Sister Nicole, come and get ready. The first revival on the day of Pentecost began with a demand. For it didn't didn't start in Jerusalem. It, It happened before that when Jesus said, I want you to go and tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. Jesus said, I want you to go and do something. I want you to, to get ready. I want you to go and wait there. And then something's going to happen. And then... In the upper room, not all of them followed, but some of them did. And they obeyed Jesus and they went to Jerusalem and they waited and they believed and they trusted. And only then was the Holy Ghost poured out. How many want to see revival in 2014? How many want to see God do great and mighty things? All right, here's here's this. I'm closing with this. Number one, if you want revival, you've got to show up. Someone said show up. 
And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. If you want revival, you're going to have to show up and come together and come to the house of God and believe that God is going to do something. Number two, if you want revival, you've got to pray up. Acts 1 and 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. So you've got to show up. You've got to pray up. And number three, if you want revival, you've got to speak up. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Can I ask us a question as we stand tonight in closing? How many people have we witnessed to this week? If I asked us how many of us desired revival... I imagine about 100% of us would raise our hands and say, yes, we we want revival. But how many of, of us this week have spoke up to someone and said, can I tell you about Jesus? Can I tell you? Can I tell you what the word of God says? Repent. Be baptized. Did you know that's not just the preacher's job? That's not just my job. That's our job as a church to reach the world. Let me ask us another question. I know we'd all raise our hand and say we want revival, but how many of us have prayed for revival this week? How many of us have got down and prayed and said, Lord, I I desire for a demonstration. I desire an outpouring. I wonder if we could, during this three-day period of prayer and fasting, I wonder if there's anyone that would be willing to commit with me and say, Brother French, not only do I want a demonstration, but I'm willing to meet the demands that God has placed. I'm willing to reach out. I'm willing to reach to the lost. You know, it's not just a missionary's job. Sometimes we quote uh, Matthew 28, 19, and we talk about going into all the world and preaching the gospel, and, and, we, and we think that's, that's for the missionaries. The missionaries are doing that, and we give some missionaries, and then we remove ourselves. But you know what? There are people in our own neighborhood. There are people who live down the street from us who have never, ever heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've never even read Acts 2.38. No one's ever talked to them. No one's ever prayed for them. They have never felt the touch of the Holy Ghost. A missionary in Africa can't reach those people, but we can reach those people. And God is calling us to go into all the world. That means our neighborhood. That means our city. That means our next door neighbor. And say, let me tell you about Jesus. I know we can't be pushy. I know we can't beat people up with the gospel. But we can preach the truth in love. How many believe that tonight? And I know this isn't my usual style of preaching tonight. But I feel this in the Holy Ghost. I know that we pray for our families. And I know we pray for the sick. And we pray for our needs. But what about the people that we don't know. That we've never met. That are desperate for God tonight. The drug addict strung out tonight that if he doesn't get a hold of God soon, he's going to die alone and no one's even going to know. Did you know God cares about that person just as much as he cares about us? The homeless person tonight who's going to be who's going to be cold and hungry. God cares about that person and he's calling Apostolic Tabernacle in 2014 to go into all the world and preach the gospel go into all of Atlanta, into our neighborhoods, our families, our cities. He's calling us to seek first the kingdom of God and believe that his righteousness will be added to us. But we will not see the miraculous and we will not see revival unless we go and do what God has called us to do. Can we bow our heads all over this sanctuary right now? Dear Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help us. Oh God. Pray that you would help us to have a burden, Lord. A burden for the lost. Not just for our own lives, but Lord, for those that we've never met that we don't know. And I pray that you would help us to meet the demand and the calling that you placed on our life. To reach somebody with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wonder if there's anyone tonight that would be willing to come around this altar. And I wonder if we could come. And I want us to do something different than we usually do. I know that we all have loved ones and family members 
that we'd like to pray for, and we can do that. But I wonder if there would be someone who'd be willing to come and say, I want to pray for my neighbor who I've never met. I want to pray for that person down the road. I've seen them, but I don't even know their name. And I'm asking that the Lord would help us to reach them with the gospel. Could we pray for people we don't even know tonight? I, I know that it's hard, but that's really what God has called us to do. God's calling us to pray for people that we don't even know. Maybe even people that don't, that don't necessarily have a connection to us. God is calling the church to reach those people with the gospel. Come on, church. Can we come and pray right now all over this sanctuary as they begin to sing? Come on, let's pray for the lost. God wants to bring a demonstration. Hallelujah, hallelujah.